I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, all of you to IDRC or welcome you back to IDRC as the case might be. Uh, my name is Rohinton Medara. I'm the Vice President for Programs here and it is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome uh, in our midst uh, Professor uh, Matthew Smith. Uh, it's, it's almost asthmatic to say that to understand a country one has to understand its history. And I think it's an equally central proposition that a country's history is effectively uh, about its people, its people within its geographical borders and, of course, the idea of the nation and the ideas of its people wherever they might be. Uh, Matthew Smith has made a career and a very eminent career as an academic uh, at the University of the West Indies, studying precisely these currents and helping us understand what they might mean both for contemporary historical thought as well as perhaps for more recent uh, events. Uh, he is a social and political historian by training. Uh, he has had very many uh, awards in his time. He is a Fulbright scholar. He has written what many consider to be the definitive book on aspects of Caribbean social history and political history, uh, the full title of which is Red and Black in Haiti, Radicalism, Conflict, and Political Change, 1934 to 1957, which I think was published in 2009 and won the eminent prize in the region in 2010. Uh, we asked Matthew to reflect on something that has been central to his thinking and work uh, the past decade and more, which is the diaspora and the flow of Haitians and others into and out of the country and what that might mean for our understanding of the country. Uh, no one better than Matthew to do that. So once again, uh, welcome, Matthew, to IDRC, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, the ground rules are as usual. Uh, Matthew will speak to us for about between 30 and 45 minutes, which leaves about that much time for questions and discussion from the floor, and we look forward to it. Matthew. Thank you very much, Rohinton. And um, thanks to everyone for coming Good afternoon. I'm glad to see um, so many people here uh, to hear my, my presentation this afternoon. It's my first time in Ottawa. I have to thank the IDRC for bringing me here. Um, I don't know if they have to thank me for bringing the weather, but <laughs> it's really, really warm weather that reminds me a lot of where I'm coming from, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. It's my first time in this part of Canada. Uh, my presentation this afternoon is on a topic that I have been doing a lot of research on uh, of late, and one that I believe is of interest to many folks who are uh, concerned with issues of diaspora, but specifically to my area, uh, the issues of the Haitian diaspora, the, um, the history of the Haitian diaspora, as well as some of the implications of diasporic history on how we understand contemporary Haiti. Attention to the many movements of millions of Haitians from their native land to locations across the globe has increased significantly since the 1980s. This heightened attention, of course, parallels the spread of Haitians themselves and the emergence of prominent Haitian communities, second generation Haitians, and people of Haitian ancestry as a vibrant voice, particularly among non-Hispanic Caribbeans in North America. It also has much to do with concurrent developments in Haiti itself over the course of this period of heightened outmigration overthrows, dictatorships, coups, and most traumatically, last year, the earthquake of January the 12th, 2010. The past year and a half since that catastrophe has witnessed yet another assertion of the Haitian communities that collectively comprise the Haitian diaspora as an important element in discussions of recovery and rebuilding. In the presidential campaign last year, President Michel Martelly used the Haitian diaspora as one of his platforms. He, it has continued to feature significantly in his uh, policies and his plans for Haitian development. His very recent initiative of using money from wire transfers and phone calls to Haiti from the diaspora to fund his national education program is just one highlight of the importance that he sees and finds in the Haitian diaspora. But what exactly is the Haitian diaspora? 
How did this diaspora evolve, and what are its features? Well, the phrase Haitian diaspora itself didn't actually come into common usage in reference to Haitian communities outside of Haiti till the 1980s. One of the prominent scholars of the Haitian diaspora, Nina Glick Schiller, in a recent essay, reminds us that it wasn't uh, until that period that it began to be more widespread in groups other than theologians. <clears throat> Thus, both in etymology and usage, the idea of a Haitian diaspora, which often is used to connote unity, also contains within it diversity, diversity of the Haitian migrants, as well as the diversity of the migrant experience. To quote Glick Schiller, quote, the term diaspora has always been one of distance as well as connection. The, dis the distance of diasporic connection was and continues to be a product of the ways being Haitian varies across divisions of age, gender, class, color, as well as the length of time away from Haiti. The generation of migrant migration and the locality of settlement also impact on this. This emphasis on differences among members of the Haitian diaspora cautions us to recognize the heterogeneity of Haitian migrant communities and emphasizes the need to closely examine them based not only on their distance from Haiti, but their distance from each other. Thus, Haitian communities in Paris in the 1960s need to be studied differently from those in, in Congo or Zaire during the same decade, even though they, they both left Haiti at the same time and for similar reasons. Similarly, this distancing is also temporal. Haitians who arrived in Canada in the 1960s exhibit differences, no doubt, of Haitians who have arrived more recently. So in order for us to properly appreciate this emphasis on difference, to realize that we can't lump all Haitians together, nor can we lump the diasporic experience together, I want to highlight three interrelated elements that characterize most studies of the Haitian diaspora and offer some comments. First, location. Second, size. And third, history. Location. Location often influences the way in which we treat the Haitian diaspora. Quite often, more attention is paid to locations where there are greater numbers of Haitians living. Say, for example, North America versus the French Caribbean. North America, where official, state, uh, official data from uh, the United States claims that there are almost 800,000 Haitians living there. If we compare that to the French Caribbean, where there is 27,000 through official statistics, one sees that the way in which this difference can often impact on the way people treat the diaspora and scholars study. The second and related issue is that of size. The numbers of Haitians in particular locations becomes a critical feature in understanding the scale of the Haitian diaspora. It gives us an indication of the demographic concentration of the diaspora, and it can also give us information on the periods of migration as well. At what point did certain locations become expansive, and what point did others not take off in like fashion? The third point is that of history. Now, history is vital in understanding when migrants left Haiti, how they moved, where they settled, and the contrasting experiences of first versus second, third, etc. generation migrants. Importantly, the history of studying the Haitian diaspora gives us a sense of the conditions in Haiti at the time of departure and those in the countries that they went to. Now, these three features have a bearing on how we treat and study the Haitian diaspora. They influence how migration researchers approach the study of Haitian communities and account for their differences. But there's a danger here. Scholars guided by larger numbers, higher concentrations in certain locations, and the more recent history of Haitian migration primarily to North America since the Duvalier era of the late 1950s and 1980s, obscure the importance of other experiences of Haitian migration. The result can be a perspective that does not fully consider the depth of the Haitian migratory experience over time. It also minimizes the importance of smaller migrations in other locations. But suppose we look at Haitian migration another way. Suppose we shift our lens to a different location, smaller numbers of Haitian migrants, and an earlier history of migration. What can this tell us about the complexity of Haitian migration? 
What can this tell us about the differing experiences and the creation of patterns of Haitian migration? If we consider the migrations of Haitians to other Caribbean countries, it can help us broaden our conceptualization of the Haitian diaspora. The Caribbean, especially neighboring Dominican Republic, the islands of Cuba, Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, St. Thomas, St. Croix, Curaçao, Martinique, and Guadeloupe have long been receivers of Haitian migration, dating all the way back to the 19th century. The imprint of these early migrations is more pronounced on some islands, though all were part of Haitian circuits of migration. Moving around in this time period was not easy. In the Haitian Revolutionary era, the earliest migrants of the late 18th and early 19th century were French planters who carried with them enslaved peoples to their destinations. Planters, by virtue of their French citizenship, had greater access and freedom to move. Hence, we find several cases of near constant relocating of French families across the Caribbean archipelago and moving to Cuba and then northward to Louisiana and for some back to France itself. But the migrants who came after in the mid 19th century when the Haitian state had been consolidated and the former French Saint-Domingue became Haiti had a different experience. Not only did they not bear French citizenship, they were also faced with limited space to move. Up until 1834, Haiti's closest neighbors were still slave colonies. Full freedom did not arrive in the British West Indies until 1838, more than four decades after emancipation arrived in Haiti. The United States didn't get in emancipation till the Civil War with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. And for Cuba, this didn't arrive until 1886. It is therefore not surprising that some of the first post-independence migration in Haiti was internal. But even internally, there were challenges and limitations of space to move, for the Haitian state required passports for movement between provinces up until the 1840s. The notion of space and the availability of space to migrate was therefore far more circumscribed in this period and this limited the availability of sites to move to. Also, up until the mid-1840s, Haiti had achieved a certain degree of political stability. There was authoritarian rule. But between 1818 and 1843, President Jean-Pierre Boyer successfully managed to protect his presidency until he was unable to do so anymore and was overthrown in 1843. The overthrow of Boyer a year after a devastating earthquake in the northern department of Haiti that ravaged Capetian was the beginning of a long and complicated series of political coups that would last for the next few years. The shift in Haitian political stability was coincident with the full abolition of slavery in the British West Indies. Thus, what we find happening at roughly the same time is a new set of circumstances prevailing in Haiti that encouraged migration when a new space for Haitian migration was opening up, the British colonies, and particularly Haiti's closest neighbor, Jamaica. Now, at first blush, Jamaica may not strike us as an important location in the long history of the Haitian diaspora. Indeed, the differences between Haiti and Jamaica stand out most. Different colonial experiences, different histories, different languages. Jamaica was a British colony until 50, almost 50 years ago, 1962 whereas Haiti had independence in 1804. But the physical closeness of the two islands is important and a telling factor in how the connection between them developed. And from Haiti's birth, this proximity meant that Jamaica would become involved in Haitian affairs. If the Haitian Revolution, as is now commonly asserted and recognized, created shockwaves across the world in the early 19th century, then its first tremors were in the islands nearest to Haiti. Jamaica never experienced anything like the Haitian Revolution. The military strength of the British colonial army was sufficient to contain the large-scale explosion of a similar revolt, though resistance and rebellion did occur. A significant consequence of revolutionary era Haiti on Jamaica was the migration of French emigres to Jamaica in that first wave of migration from uh, the western half of Hispaniola that I earlier mentioned. This began, by some accounts, within three days of the outbreak of the revolt in the north of Haiti in 1791. 
Today in Jamaica, we can find people whose surnames can be traced all the way back to that first generation. Espute, Malab, Vendries, uh, Duqueney, uh, Brande, etc. So from quite early on, Jamaica was part of Haitian migration history. The events of the 1830s to 1840s that I previously mentioned, the earthquake, the coups, the overthrow of Boyer, were to deepen this relationship. When Boyer was overthrown in 1843, he left Haiti with his family and closest advisors to Jamaica as an exile. He was the first Haitian president to be overthrown by coup d'etat, and he was also the first Haitian president to be sent in exile. The exile of Boyer was the beginning of a long period of instability in Haiti, but also a precedent for further presidential exile. When his successors were overthrown, they too traveled to Jamaica. In fact, political exile to Jamaica became commonplace for all Haitian presidents. Between 1818 and 1902, Haiti had 16 heads of state, 11 of whom spent years in Jamaica's exiles. At least three of them died in, Haiti, in Jamaica. Of the remaining five who were not exiled to Jamaica, three died in office, one was executed, and the other retired after serving his term. Most of Haiti's would-be presidents of the period also spent years living in Jamaica. Now, this is a remarkable statistic, and one that highlights the importance of Jamaica in the universe of 19th century Haitian politics. The exile of Haitian presidents were accompanied by the exile of political dissidents and supporters to Jamaica during the same period. Jamaica became a hub for many Haitian political exiles whose presence there was never easily tolerated by Haitian leaders back home. It was so commonplace that by 1903, an entire Haitian opposition party, numbering almost 100, were headquartered in downtown Kingston. It is therefore necessary for us to understand how this functioned, how this process of exile worked, and why Jamaica became the destination for Haitian exiles during this period, and indeed, why this situation became more complicated as the 19th century progressed. Exiles are commonly distinguished from refugees in this way. Exiles are banished officially, by presidential decree or otherwise. They have no choice. They are forced by the government to leave the country. In 19th century Haiti, this official imposition was routine during changes of government for obvious reasons. Political contests were sometimes brutal armed struggles, and the coexistence of political opponents in Haiti was often seen as intolerable for the new leader. Once the new spaces for migration that I mentioned before opened up in the mid-19th century, official exile was given to opponents so they could leave immediately. With the liberalism of British asylum laws and the creation of important social networks in Jamaica, a point that I will expand on later, the exiles invariably found themselves in the British consulate requesting passage to Jamaica. On their behalf, the British consul or vice consul would apply for permission to escort them to a British vessel in harbor, whereafter they would be transported to Jamaica. These scenes could often be dramatic. In one instance, the son of a Haitian president had to disguise himself in the flag of a foreign country and to walk to the, um, to, to the harbor so that he wouldn't be attacked during a period of overthrow. Uh, in another instance, a, a, a clever ruse was devised between the um, British consul and the president. He knew that overthrow was imminent. He wanted to go to Jamaica without being harmed. So the, the ruse was that this is in the mid-1840s is that you call the army out to the, um, to, to the docks in front of Port-au-Prince, and you, you are under the guise that you're doing a routine inspection. And at the moment that you want to leave, a ship will be waiting in harbor for Kingston, to go to Kingston, and when no one is looking, you'll be pushed on the ship and set, uh, and set sail to Kingston. Uh, these somewhat humorous uh, instances need to be counterbalanced with the more common tragic images of people, particularly in the southern coast of Haiti, who would have lost everything during revolutionary overthrows. Their houses would be burnt down. Uh, sometimes they had nothing but what they were wearing, and there would be women and children wailing as they took the gangplank on a ship bound for Jamaica. In 1844 and 1848, Jamaica received nearly 300 such persons. In 1868 and again in the 1880s, 
large numbers of Haiti's southern inhabitants took flight to the neighboring island in the wake of violent clashes. It was not only opponents who were sent away. The great preoccupation of Haitian presidents during the 19th century was that internal instability could threaten their rule and invite external intervention. The security of the republic was always held as a paramount for Haitian independence. Movements against the head of state sometimes started in his own chambers. And in order to prevent this, presidents would, often put, uh, would offer potential government rivals diplomatic posts as a means of keeping them out of the country where they could potentially stir up trouble. Now let's look at refugees and how that compares to what I've just described of Haitian exile migration. Refugees in the 19th century were, by contrast, people who were not offered a choice to quit the island. They chose to do so because of political and economic factors. So in the 19th century, they were more political than economic, had become so untenable that they couldn't remain in Haiti. For some, their lives and those of their family members were in imminent danger. At various moments, political battles took on harsh personal class and color overtones and led to the destruction of, of property. The foreign consulates in the major cities and towns, Saint-Marc, Jacques-Mel, Jérémy, Port-Prince, and Cap-Haïtien, became havens for refugees desperately seeking admittance on a foreign ship heading out of Haiti. Then it was quite different from it is today. Uh, consuls would allow people into their private homes as well as into the, um, as well as into the consulate itself uh, for safety. They would stay there for days on end, sometimes weeks, until they got official permission to leave Haiti, or until a ship coming into the harbor that would take them to Jamaica arrived. For some, it was almost, uh, you know, some people had to run, literally, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the consulate before being harmed. At times of great upheaval, it was not unusual for this to occur many times. Foreign consulates provided international protection and were sometimes easier to get to than the port, which was always heavily manned by presidential troops, or even crossing the border to the Dominican Republic. In addition, some refugees whose lives were in very real danger, but who were destitute, also obtained funds from the consulate to purchase tickets. It has been argued by some migration scholars that the difference between exiles and refugees is a semantic one. In many ways, this is true. In the Haitian case that I'm speaking of, for example, someone could arrive at a consulate as a refugee, then apply to the consul general to petition the government on his behalf for an official decree of exile, then be regarded as an exile by the time he or she boards the ship in Port-au-Prince. And not all refugees were destitute, nor were all exiles wealthy. Prominent politicians and members of the Haitian elite could be found listed among the refugees. Likewise, some exiles had their property and wealth seized by the government at the point they were forced to leave Jamaica. <clears throat> what is common, though, is that most often exiles were people who had some degree of power. Now, it should be clear from what I've said so far why Jamaica was a major location for Haitian migrants in the 19th and early 20th century. But turning to one of the other factors that I had introduced at the beginning of my talk, what about the size of the Haitian diaspora? How big was the Haitian diaspora in Jamaica? And what was its impact on Jamaican society? Getting a sense of how many people migrated at a particular point in time is always a slippery task. It is difficult even now in the 21st century, and one can imagine how incredibly frustrating this is for people who study migration in the 19th century. Moreover, because we're studying a past, we can't do the fine-tuned ethnographic studies that are associated with more modern migration studies. For the Caribbean, we don't, we simply do not have surviving records of intra-Caribbean migration or anything akin to the detailed passenger lists and records we find in Europe and North America, which is why Caribbean historians like myself look with envy at Ancestry.com and just wish that we had even one piece of that document to, to trace. Emigration bureaus that were set up in the British colonies were largely concerned with documenting indentured labor from India and China. There was, as always, some degree of Haitian labor migration during this period, but not a great deal of this was agricultural labor. A lot of it was domestic labor. The domestic laborers from Haiti actually circulated across the Caribbean during the 19th century. 
But the large numbers of Haitian laborers that we see in the 20th century Dominican Republic and Cuba were a long way off. In Jamaica during the 1840s, when the new wave of Haitian migration commenced, there was some discussion by planters as to whether or not these numbers could be used to save a declining sugar economy. But it was determined very early on that most of the Haitians who arrived in Jamaica did so with temporary uh, refuge in mind, and no one uh, wanted to settle, let alone be, be dragged into uh, agricultural labor. We therefore have to look elsewhere to determine the size of the Haitian diaspora in Jamaica. The Jamaican census data did record Haitians in the island, but the figures they provide are highly unreliable and poor indicators of the numbers. I'll give one example. In the 1844 census of a foreign-born population of 44,000, only 12 were registered as Haitians. However, between 1843 to 1848, as many as 600 to 800 Haitians had arrived in Jamaica during that period when one looks at consular reports coming out of Port-au-Prince. The same thing can be repeated for different censuses. It is also clear that Kingston and its neighboring parish of St. Andrew was the center of Haitian migrants in Jamaica. It was close to commercial activity and it offered opportunities to get involved in merchant activities, not to mention receive the latest news and visitors from Haiti arriving weekly in Kingston's harbor or nearby Port Royal. The opening of Kingston as a center for Haitian migrants and the proximity of Jamaica, of Jamaica's capital to Port-au-Prince, also meant that there was a great deal of commercial trade between the two islands that developed as this migration expanded. Jamaican women sellers would travel to Haiti for goods and Haitians would import Jamaican products. This is a conduit of trade facilitated by the migration of Haitians to Jamaica. Each crossing deepened the contact. And as the century progressed, this migration was not only uh, encouraged, sorry, as the century progressed, this migration was encouraged by the political situation. There were opportunities to be found in both islands. And what this tells us is that there is an entire universe of Haitian migration that is not captured in the records. To be sure, the size of the Haitian diaspora in 19th century Jamaica was not as large as 20th century migration elsewhere. But when considering this, we must be sensitive to the demographic distance between the 19th and the 20th centuries. At the end of the century, the population of Jamaica was roughly 650,000 people. Today, it is almost 3 million. It is extraordinarily difficult to state how many people were living in Haiti by the end of the 19th century, as no official census was done in Haiti till the 1940s. But based on the best estimates, someone, it would be somewhere between 1 to 2 million people by the end of the century. Today, it's almost 10 million. So one really needs to factor in this change. <clears throat> but the population expansion in the 20th century and the demand for new labor led to larger, more familiar migrations of Haitians and Jamaicans in the 20th century. But the presence of Haitians in Jamaica was important, and it was important enough to become part of Jamaican uh, society and reality during that period. A Jamaica newspaper from 1903 affirmed, quote, Jamaica has always been regarded by Haitians as a second home and Jamaicans have become so accustomed to the presence of Haitians in their midst that they are scarcely looked upon as strangers." End quote. With this in mind, I want to look a little bit now at how Haitians actually settled in Jamaica and how they adjusted to life and migration there. As the years progressed, Haitians had to consider various means by which they could develop stronger connections with Jamaica, given the frequency of Haitian residency there. For some, this meant establishing firm roots in Jamaica by living there permanently. It is not clear how many Haitians actually applied for British citizenship or to live in Jamaica, though I would suspect there were, there were likely few who chose this path. Haitian nationality and naturalization laws were very restrictive in the 19th century. According to the Haitian Civil Code of 1893, any Haitian who becomes a naturalized foreigner would have to leave Haiti and could not return to Haiti until after a period of five years, whereupon that person would have to then apply for Haitian citizenship regardless of the fact that they were born there the same way a foreigner would. 
Since many Haitian exiles fled Haiti at times of political turmoil, leaving behind families, businesses, and personal interests, this stipulation was probably a deterrent against seeking citizenship elsewhere. Moreover, given the generally low state of the Jamaican economy after the decline in sugar production in the 1840s, Jamaica was not always viewed as a favorable place to settle down. Kingston, for much of the post-slavery period, was underdeveloped with visible signs of great poverty. In 1850 to 1852, and briefly again in 1854, Jamaica was ravaged by a pernicious cholera epidemic, possibly the worst outbreak of cholera in the Caribbean in the 19th century. The bookend tragedy in this, in this was in the early 20th century what, with the uh, great earthquake in Kingston in 1907. Like Haiti, Jamaica's main cities in the 19th century were also plagued by devastating fires over the course of that period. Apart from the economic challenges and the natural and epidemiological disasters, Jamaica was still a colony of the British Empire, while Haiti remained free and independent. Thus, Haitian exiles considered all these realities when adjusting to their new residence. Jamaica was a convenient place of refuge, given its proximity to Haiti, but it may not have been ultimately an attractive place to settle down. Haitian migration to Jamaica then was defined by a large degree of mobility, circularity, movement back and forth between the two islands, as well as enduring psychological connections with Haiti. What was most sought after by Haitian exiles was not necessarily permanent settlement, but the building of strong and reliable networks with Jamaica that could be useful during times of political and social crisis back home. These developed largely through business and family ties, and they served a dual purpose. They connected Haiti to Jamaica more closely, particularly through commercial linkages. And secondly, they were thing, the, the family ties were uh, safe, safety valves, if you will, that Haitians could rely on during times of political crisis. I'll give an example of how this, this often operated. Uh, Haitians merchants who would come to, to Jamaica, some would set up businesses there. Uh, as you get the development of a Jamaican migration as well to Haiti during this period, uh, you would have perhaps one business in Kingston and that business would have another uh, store in, um, in Port-au-Prince. Uh, quite often these were done by the merchant elite. They are the ones who, were, uh, who benefited the most from this. Uh, <clears throat> an example that may resonate for some of us who are familiar with Haitian history is the famous Haitian historian Jean Fouchard. Uh, Jean Fouchard's father actually lived in Jamaica for eight years. He owned a hotel in Jamaica that he operated in Kingston. Uh, he had been to Jamaica several times as an exile before settling there for his longest stretch in 1902. And uh, conceivably, he built up connections with the Jamaican business elite that would allow him uh, to, con to, to manage and to operate this hotel in Kingston. Sometimes other Haitians actually joined businesses with Jamaicans uh, during, during the 19th century as well. So some would come and they would be co-owners of a business in Jamaica. These types of associations, considered with the closeness of the two islands and the numbers of exiles and refugees in Kingston and the frequency of migrations, explain the fear of intrigues from Jamaica that haunted every Haitian president of the 19th century. Most of the Haitian presidents, up until the US occupation of Haiti in 1915, petitioned the British government to intervene and control the movements and activities of Haitians in Jamaica. But these very political leaders who opposed the presence of their opponents in Jamaica benefited from the same British protection when they were overthrown, and quite often used the same means and measures of their opponents in trying to get back into Haiti and assume power. These networks, political and business networks, were deepened by family ties. Marriages between Haitians and Jamaicans were an expected outcome of Haitian migration to Jamaica. This was especially so among the second generation Haitians. Haitians who decided to stay in Jamaica were often children of first arrivals, and the longer they stayed, the greater likelihood that they would marry Jamaicans. This practice strengthened in the 19th century and also into the 20th century. Over time, the names of these arrivals would be anglicized as they marry people with uh, English names, both in pronunciation and spelling. 
but they nonetheless carry the roots of this history. Sometimes the French names through marriage were erased completely, making difficult identification of Haitian origins. In Haiti, similarly, this connection resulted in the English surnames that one can find in Haiti today that are traceable back to Jamaica. To capture the importance of these marriage networks and their role in shaping Haitian communities in Jamaica, researchers have to rely a great deal on genealogical investigation. These are simply not reflected in the um, surviving documentary records. Careful study of family histories reveals otherwise imperceptible layers of connection between the two countries and the complicated history of the Haitian diaspora. This is something that in my own work I've discovered. And I'll give one anecdote of uh, someone, a family that I've been studying. The granddaughter of a Haitian president who came with his entire family in, uh, to Jamaica in the 1860s, actually died there. She married a Haitian, a Jamaican. Uh, at the time that her daughter, uh, uh, her, the, the child that they had from their union, turned 18, they sent her back to Haiti. The reason was to learn more about the country and reconnect with her family. Well, she goes back to Haiti. She falls in love with Haiti and also in love with a young Haitian doctor. She never goes back to Jamaica. She stays there and has a family with him and raises children. When her daughter, who's the person I interviewed, turned 18, in keeping with family practice, she sent her back to Jamaica to learn about the Jamaican side of her family. She then marries a Jamaican doctor and never returns to Haiti. Now this one example from one family and one branch of a family illustrates the importance of family ties and movement, particularly among those who could afford to move back and forth, but it also illustrates some of the challenges and benefits of capturing this history. The presence of a foreign-born community in Haiti provided critical opportunities for elite Haitians, in particular, to form what we would today call transnational networks, especially through marriage and business connections. So important was this bond that as a Jamaican traveler to Haiti in 1902 commented, uh, quote, there are many whose family connections have linked Haiti with Jamaica, end quote. As I mentioned in regard to business ties, family ties held great importance during periods of political uprising in Haiti. Through marriage to Jamaicans, Haitians could claim British protection. They could also have the right to actually hoist the Union Jack outside their house during a period of a coup or a revolution as a sort of immunity from attack. The Certificate of Nationality, a thin one-page document that bore a consular stamp and the person's name that, that declared someone was a British subject, was a honored and treasured document among uh, Haitians who held it in the 19th century, something like the green card today. In the chaos and panic, panic that followed political upheaval, the British consulates would be flooded with Haitians claiming that they had British citizenship or were British subjects through a, a, a connection in their families. Uh, another uh, article in the Haitian nationality law of the 19th century was that when a Haitian woman married a foreigner, she assumed the nationality of her husband. And so a lot of women would come in and claim that they were married uh, to, their, to, to, to a, a Jamaican or a West Indian and use that as a claim to try and get passage to Jamaica. Uh, likewise, you had situations where children would come in and change their names and register their names differently so that they could also benefit from that. Family ties also strengthened business connections between the two islands. There are some families that had very deep contacts between the two islands, uh, both Jamaican and Haitian families. Now, in closing, I would like to offer a few remarks. First, it will be readily apparent from the history sketched in my talk this afternoon that the migration I've discussed is quite different from the more familiar mid-20th century migration from Haiti. In the 19th century, the reasons for migration were largely political, although economic factors did motivate people to leave. There were dictatorships and authoritarian military governments but with the exception of Boyer's long rule and that of Faustin Souluk, who ruled from 1847 to 1859, none of Haiti's administrations had anything close to the longevity of the Duvalier dynasty. Nor did they have Duvalierism's reputation for terror and rep repression. 
Thus, political instability may have prompted Haitians to leave, but it did not offer any guarantees for the succeeding administrations. When a leader was overthrown, scores of Haitians would return home, and new migrants would replace them overseas. This produced incredible mobility on the part of Haitian migrants in the 19th century, once the diasporic space widened by the mid-century. The second point, intra-Caribbean movement was an important feature of Haitian migration in the period before the US occupation of Haiti. It was easier to travel to neighboring islands, and the proximity to Haiti allowed migrants to remain in touch with events back home. Hispanophone islands attracted a great deal of attention, but the demand for a large labor migration to Cuba and the Dominican Republic arose later on. Earlier, a non-labor movement of exiles, refugees, migrants dominated. The Spanish, French, Dutch, Danish Caribbean, and especially the British Caribbean was, more attracti was, was attractive to Haitian exiles during that period. The abolition of slavery in the British Caribbean in the late 1830s, which coincided with renewed Haitian exile in the early 1840s, made neighboring Jamaica appealing to Haitian migrants. This migratory history, which spanned some 80 years, began to decline in the 20th century when the United States entered the Caribbean as a major power and reconfigured the circuits of Haitian migration. This coincided with a drastic revision of British asylum laws around World War I. And, as I mentioned earlier, new demands for Haitian and Jamaican labor within the Caribbean during that period. The Duvalier dictatorship of the 1960s presented Haiti with its most repressive era since 1915. Much had changed between 1915 and 1957 when Duvalier rose to power, not the least of which were the circuits of Haitian migration. Finally, Haitians of an earlier period in the history of the Haitian diaspora managed the adaptation to their new circumstances in less familiar places in various ways. Business and family interests serve several functions as I've outlined. In this we find similarities with more recent migrations where family relations are important aspects of the communities of Haitian migrants. The Haitian diaspora has had a long and multifaceted history of development. Assumptions that Haitian migrants have always negotiated their space within the diaspora in the same ways are misplaced. Haitians, like other Caribbean populations, have always moved. And the reason and consequences of their movement have been guided by changing circumstances that have much to do with what prevails in their homeland at, at various moments in its long history. The example of Jamaica that I have outlined this afternoon demonstrates the importance of recovering past histories of Haitian migration to arrive at a more fulsome understanding of the experiences and contributions of the Haitian diaspora. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for that quite so vivid account of how <coughs> the, the movement of people leads to the movement of ideas and attitudes which then come back to interplay with forces at home and, and helps us in some senses understand both uh, stability and change uh, in Haiti and in the region. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, I, there are two microphones at each end and I'd ask that the usual ground rule applies, which is identify yourself, uh, ask a succinct question preceded by an even more succinct commentary if you must, and the floor is open. Well, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Go ahead. Kevin Potty from the University of Ottawa, and thank you very much for a, a wonderful uh, presentation. I found it very um, intriguing when you talk about how with the diaspora you have to consider how far away the diaspora is from the home country and maybe also how much they've changed or, you know, or temporarily how long they've been away. I guess I, I wonder, um, because we have diasporas from other countries, I think of Somalia as a, another great example of a very strong diaspora. I wonder if you've studied uh, or you've ever com compared the Haitian diaspora to another diaspora whether that could be helpful in um, some of these interpretations.
Carrie Levitt from uh, Montreal, McGill University. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for that f a very vivid and interesting historical talk. Um, I have a number of questions. The first one um, has really to do with the role of the British consul in the as you describe it, obviously, I mean, Britain was a great power, and uh, Jamaica was uh, very close that this would be a very good place for exiles and refugees uh, to use, you know, for all the reasons you've said. My question is, was there any other European power at the time in Haiti uh, with uh, offering uh, anything like a similar kind of assistance? That's one question. The next one, I think you've explained some of it, but it's really about the social composition of those um, migrants who came to Jamaica at this time. Um, could you give us a little analysis of the, so the, the class breakdown, the background, educational? Uh, what would the educational qualifications be higher than uh, the kind of people that they would associate with in Jamaica. Um, so a little bit on that. And finally, I suppose it's a, a wish <laughs> that you might someday wish to extend your study of the Haitian diaspora to Canada and come and give us a, uh, a, a an, an account of the different histories and different compositions of the Toronto and the Montreal Haitian communities. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, the uh, first question about uh, comparative uh, diasporas, uh, th that's, that's an interesting question. And personally, in my work, I haven't done that. Um, uh, I've been really focused a lot on the Haitian diaspora and how it relates to movements within the Caribbean. Um, my, my interest really sort of evolved out of my, my deeper research interest in Haitian political history. And from that, I wanted to see the sorts of consequences of, of Haitian politics and, and changes and, and transitions. And exile and migration is an obvious one that's, that's never really been, been looked at very closely. And so connecting that with events in Haiti has sort of been the, the, the motor that's guided a lot of my, my research. But I will definitely agree, yes, there, the issue of uh, comparative migratory experiences between Haitians and other groups is quite important. And, and, and there is work that's being done on some of that now. Um, one of the things one finds often with migration studies is that comparative migration studies, particularly among Caribbean populations, has not been as, as strong. I mean, we have really good studies huh, of, of various populations. I mean, there's you know, the this, this scholarship on Jamaican migrants, there's scholarship on uh, Cuban immigration, uh, and uh, the, the sort of cross-linguistic, cross-border sorts of comparisons are not as frequent uh, in, in the literature as, as one would like. So I mean, even just you know, looking at Somalians is an interesting case, but even just within the Caribbean itself, doing this sort of work among different Caribbean groups um, is, would be interesting to discover what that means. Um, and again, it, uh, part of it comes to this larger point that I, I raised at the end of my talk about the sort of reconfiguring of the space of, of movement and the space of diaspora with the entry of the United States into that space and what that sort of meant for each individual territory and, um, and how that sort of transposed into their, their individual histories. Um, to, to Carrie's point, thanks for all your comments and, and those questions. Uh, I mean, the, the first one about the role of the British consulate, yes, it, it, the British consulate had a, a, a huge role in Haiti during this period. And the British vice consul, uh, who was basically, I mean, the consulate was divided across the island, and uh, you had one central vice consul was really a, a, a privileged position. Um, it was that person that the president would turn to quite often to get British support. As you mentioned, Britain was a very important power. And gaining support from Great Britain for a presidency, approval, recognition, was, was critical. Um, perhaps even more so than the United States up to a certain point, because the United States didn't even officially recognize Haiti as an independent nation until much later. Uh, France recognized Haiti first. 
after the indemnity agreement in 1825, and very soon after Great Britain, and Great Britain sent a vice consul to, to Haiti in the 1820s, which was before many other um, European powers had. So that longer history of the British presence there, that connection of the British presence there, and the power that the vice consul uh, wielded was really, really important. Um, it's no surprise, if you think about that, that the most famous book written, and or I should really say infamous book ever written on Haiti in the 19th century and still had resonance later, was uh, by a former British consul, uh, Spencer St. John, who wrote a book about Haiti, which was very racist and, and a very terrible um, depiction, but it does demonstrate a certain degree of the power that, that these, these, these folks had. Now, other European powers did grant similar um, exile and, and, and privileges and benefits of it, yes. And the main ones during this period would be the Spanish, the French, uh, the British, as the 19th century progresses, you have the Americans, the United States Consul, and you also have the Germans. Um, but the key thing with the British, though, is again Jamaica. Because they, a lot of Haitian elites knew that if they got exile through the, Jama through, through the British Consul and they got uh, approval for Jamaica is very close. And, you, know, and you, you see this all the time. Some of them claim they can't handle the European weathers, they can't handle different climates, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that there isn't migration to these other locations. There is. Um, but, there, but the attraction of Jamaica during that period was quite significant, especially when these, these business and family ties deepen, uh, because people then have other interests in Jamaica that make it uh, important for them to go there. The issue of the social analysis of, of the people. These were, a lot of the people I'm speaking of were primarily elites. Now, it's very difficult to track the sort of non-elite migration during this period. What one gets is uh, numbers. For instance, you know, as I mentioned, you know, 600 people arriving during the mid-1840s. Now, it'd be hard to imagine all of those were elite arrivals in Jamaica during that period. Uh, but it's very hard to trace that. St. Thomas was another major location in the Virgin Islands for, for Haitian migrants, and some of that would be elite mixed with uh, non-elite migrants. A lot of domestic laborers would go there, etc. cetera. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to break it down. Um, in terms of education, uh, compared to other Jamaicans, the reports one gets in the, in the records is that it is, you know, it's, it's quite often praise for the Haitians who arrived. You don't really, and this is a, another difference that one sees with this 19th century migration versus later ones, you don't really see in the Jamaican press during that period any sort of denigration or negative stereotyping. Quite often it's a defense of Haiti and Haitians, if anything. Um, and some of it has to do with the, the people that, you know, the elites who are writing, who are also um, commingling with Haitian elites who are coming to Jamaica, the connections that people have over time and so forth. So it's, it depends on who they're exposed to as well. Um, and yes, I mean, it would be interesting to kind of look at, at this with Canada. Um, I, I believe other people have been doing that work, uh, um, but I think it is an interesting question for sure. Matthew, <coughs> while we set ourselves up, yes, Carl, for a second round, let me uh, ask you a question, uh, a broad one along these lines. Uh, you, you, you give us this sort of compelling story of the region and Jamaica in particular serving almost as an outlet uh, for political ferment in Haiti, and that can work both ways. It can be a safety valve, which actually keeps uh, Haitian polity stable or stable relative to the times, or it can make things or it can create a situation in Haiti in which, since exile and refuge is always an option, uh, there is a sense that if you win, your opponents can be made to go away, and so it doesn't quite breed sort of democratic yeah. tradition in situ. Uh, at the end of this round, perhaps you might give us a sense of how you would assess mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the outlet that mm -hmm. Jamaica provided to Haitian sure. politics. Carl? Um, Carl Smith, XIDRC. I hope that's enough <laughs> identification. Um, I found your delivery educational, uh, very helpful in understanding some of the politics and history and so on. 
I, I'm sure you don't want to get too much into politics and uh, social impacts and so on in Jamaica at the present. Your, your studies were confined to a, an earlier era. But would you venture to make some sort of comment, if, if you can, about what's been happening in Jamaica vis-a-vis -vis the Haitians who have been coming recently? Um, I think that's enough. Kitsa Dorsainville with the National Council of Research, uh, Welfare, sorry, National Council of Welfare. Um, you mentioned that um, there was a huge influence uh, uh, from the British in Haiti, as well with uh, a, a building of political and business network between Jamaica and Haiti. But I was just wondering, uh, is there a reason why you think, you know, that the language influence in terms of the, like in Jamaica, they primarily speak English and in Haiti it's French, a little bit of uh, Spanish from Dominican Republic and uh, Creole. You think, is there a reason why there was, there don't seem to be any s sign of the English influence in Haiti since it was so close to Jamaica? Yeah. Thanks. Um, Carl, I hope you don't mind if I take um, um, Madame Dossinville's question. Yeah, um, the, the, the language fact is very important. Um, when we look at it from the outside, quite often it, it becomes a surprise. Jamaica being an English-speaking country, Haiti being French and Creole. And so one wonders, why would they go to Jamaica if there's this language? Wouldn't it present a barrier? It, in, in my mind, it, it doesn't preclude people from going. It's not often seen as a major issue uh, during that period. And it's not only unique to Haitians. Remember, Jamaicans went and helped build the Panama Canal. Jam uh, Haitians went there to both groups went to Cuba and worked on sugar plantations there and so forth. Uh, you know, Anglophone Caribbean circulated across the, the um, Central American rim during the, during the early 20th century. I, I think that the, the divisions that language presents are, are sort of sharpened a lot more within the 20th century. Uh, but one also has to, to consider, again, returning to the, the, the response to Professor Levitt's question, that the, the classes that are moving, huh? the classes that are coming over to, to um, Jamaica from Haiti quite often speak English. Um, there was a, a, a certain value that was placed on speaking English. Uh, Christophe promoted English. Um, Saluk promoted English. Saluk was very um, favorable to the um, the, the British uh, during his 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 period of rule. So there was a sense in which that that British traditions, language of English, but also British liberalism among some political parties, the Liberal Party in Haiti um, and other groups, was seen as a model that Haiti should follow, and something that was that that that. Educated Haitians were encouraged to 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 follow through with, um, and it's a similar situation to the language issue with um, Jamaicans who go to Haiti. Some are elite Jamaicans huh, who are going there and setting up business, but some are non-elite. And as as you know, labor migrants move around, they they learn the language. So it's never really seen as a as an impediment to, uh, to settlement. Um, was that the question? There was also, uh, yes, Carl's question about contemporary uh, Haitian migration. The, the, the impact of images of 20th century Haitian migration has shaped how even Jamaicans see Haitian migrants. I would definitely um, state that. So what we find today is a sort of negative stereotyping of the groups that come over, which is in many ways different from the period I was speaking about in my presentation. Uh, in some instances, one could say it's universes away. It's, it's a, just a completely different uh, perspective. Um, as I said, often in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, Jamaican writers would defend Haiti. Uh, against all sorts of ludicrous claims of voodoo and this and that, and they're saying that's ridiculous. Haitians are not like that. 
Whereas nowadays you have a different sort of attitude, and I'm speaking not just as someone who studies it, but someone who also teaches Haitian history to Jamaican students. And you see that sort of transition and the sort of power of a sort of global mass media and the images that it projects uh, in a very peculiar way. The way in which the news and the images are beamed at us from north, whereas Haiti is just you know, um, a one hour flight away from Jamaica. And so we, we get the news in f through other circuits. And so that, that sort of influences, influences what happens. But again, it also emphasizes, if anything, the importance of these sorts of comparative migrations across time, how one group, uh, why they left, and the consequences and reception of their leaving, as well as uh, contemporary groups as well. Um, and to, to come to uh, Rohinton's question about the, um, the space of Jamaica as a both safety valve and so on, I, it's, it's, it's true. There was this sort of um, double-edged role that Jamaica played. On the one hand, Jamaica was seen, yes, as a safety valve. You get people away, um, they go to Jamaica, and they're out of Haiti. But on the other hand, it's a space where you have too many of your opponents in one place, they can start to coalesce and plot to overthrow you. And I mean, this was literally the, um, the paranoid obsession of many Haitian presidents. They feared that some sort of movement could, could be launched from Jamaica. Uh, as they became more sophisticated, some presidents um, would send spies from Haiti to Jamaica under the guise of being refugees um, just to track these other people. And, um, and likewise, some would send, I mean, there are instances of, of market women who would leave Jamaica to go to Haiti, and they're essentially emissaries for political opponents, circulated pamphlets and so on that were run off and printed in Kingston. <coughs> so it, it, it's, it's a sort of dual role Jamaica uh, functions. But the key element in this is the British government's attitude to all of it. The British government had to be very careful as to how far it could intervene into the lives of Haitians living in Jamaica. These were people who were protected under British law as people uh, who had enjoyed asylum and should enjoy uh, the free rights and, uh, that, that are granted from that and free movement. And so they defended this quite strongly. Um, and, and so they, 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 you know, they, that was a very important factor, factor in it. Um, I think I'll pause there. Time for one last round. Carlo, go, go to one of the microphones. Yes. Hi, I'm Carlo Dade, uh, formerly with the Canadian Foundation for the Americas, Focal. Thanks. That was a very interesting look at a um, not too well known aspect of Haitian history. But one thing you said really, really struck me. You mentioned that there were a group of Haitians in Haiti that had some sort of status or recognition as foreign subjects or by a foreign power. They had the consulate document from the British. I'm wondering, how did this, well, what were the, the, the size of this group? How many Haitians had this sort of recognition? And how did this impact their status in Haiti, their legal standing? Could they still own property? Could they still work in Haiti? My name is uh, Chris Tucker. Uh, I'm a retired scientist for the federal government. Uh, I'm going to invent some history here, a what-if scenario. And I'm wondering whether some of Haiti's struggles ha in that time period were because it had been abandoned by France, if one is comparing other French Caribbean colonies, and the power of the British that filled a vacuum with the relationship between Jamaica and Haiti w was essentially uh, because of this loss of support. Uh, I don't want to build too much into it in, in terms of colonial power, but there is an element of Haiti struggling in a vacuum to develop uh, when other colonies such as Martinique, Guadeloupe maybe uh, were cushioned to some extent. Is there any viability in that kind of a premise? Hi, I'm Trisha Vandergoy. I know we've met before, actually, I think in Port-au-Prince, so it's nice to see you here again. I'm with the Canadian International Development Agency now, and um, I wanted to ask you what you were just saying now about the, 
you know, the shared history between Haitians and Jamaicans. It made me think I just finished some research with Haitian migrants in South Florida. And often people are talking in South Florida is obviously a context in which a, there's a lot of Haitian and Jamaican immigrants together. And any kind of shared reference of shared identity was usually based on, you know, the African connection or like both uh, groups originally migrating from Africa. So I was wondering, I didn't hear anything in either the Haitian uh, memory or the Jamaican memory about this shared uh, Caribbean connection. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk about the production of history in both Haiti and Jamaica and how that has perhaps been lost. So this is last call. And if there are no more questions, we'll go back to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, for Carlos, uh, questions. Yes, um, <clears throat> it's a very good question. Uh, what did that mean in terms of the status of the Haitians who held that? Um, f for them, it was you know it was clearly a, a very valuable status to hold uh, that that could benefit them at, at these moments when there was uh, where, where they could use it as a as a sort of route to to exile and to safety in Jamaica. So it was very valuable. Um, and, and sought after by some. Now, the way in which that that affected their that status affected their treatment in Haiti, it's it can be a bit murky, uh, and I'll explain why. Quite often, what what the uh, Great Britain began to discover in the late 19th century is that there were certain fabrications of people's uh, 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 allegiances through marriage, through other things. So people sort of claim that they were entitled to this because, you know, I had a great grandfather who was born in Jamaica, so you should therefore protect me and send me uh, to Jamaica now. Um, and it was very difficult to, to determine after a while the accuracy of some of these claims. Uh, it was also discovered that the, the people who would register them were in, in the book, it was all registered in the book, were um, paid off, sometimes bribed in order to, to write someone down or shift parentage and so on so that someone could benefit. It's hard to say how many people did any of this because even those registers are, they haven't survived. And basically the British Consul had a, um, a, a register of all the births, marriages, and deaths in Haiti over the year, uh, for each year that was produced. Very few of those records have actually survived intact. You have a few spotty collections, but not everyone. So you'd have to really examine that sort of stuff. And even if you do get to see it, determining the accuracy of the entries is would be very difficult to do. Um, but one would presume that there was uh, a, a certain sense of of, uh, of of deep value that was attached to that status and, and what it could mean in terms of the long term. Um, of course, the people who were elite could perhaps verify those connections more strongly and more easily. Well, that's an interesting point because quite often property laws, right, in Haiti could be circumvented through marriage. So if someone could claim through the Haitian government, I am a Haitian citizen and so I could own property, then during a moment of crisis, then claim the citizenship of their spouse so that could entitle them to British protection, it becomes, you know, they use it in these different ways. Um, uh, Charles? Chris, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the, the, the abandonment of France uh, and, and, and the way in which that may have shaped Haiti's development, I mean, I think it, it shaped it in a negative way in the other direction. Uh, France exacted from Haiti an indemnity in 1825, which was, you know, astronomical, and it, it required Haiti to spend much of its, its, its money every year to pay off that that um, that debt, it dragged on until roughly around the period of the 1870s, early 1880s, I believe it was paid off, and um, it really must be factored in in thinking about issues of Haitian poverty. If the country had to spend so much time uh, focusing on this debt, it was very difficult for it to 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 grow internally um, and and to and to achieve economic. Um, growth in, in any meaningful way and in the long term. So I think that that's really important. In terms of filling the void, yes, I do think some Haitians 
uh, politicians and, 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 and political elite did see Great Britain filling a void that had been left behind by France. In fact, some of them even petitioned to Great Britain, we, you need to come and occupy us. Some of them went that far, saying we need British occupation. Sometimes some even went to France as well. Um, you know, that's part of the confusion and contradiction, uh, asking for French occupation. Um, and then eventually the Americans were the ones who stepped in. But, um, but so it becomes a sort of complicated uh, relationship. But at the same time, there was the privileging and the pride placed in French culture and French language throughout. And uh, finally, yeah, Trisha's, Patricia's question. Yeah, um, the, the issue of identity and, and, and the production of history, it's a very, very important one. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that the folks that you've studied have looked at the African heritage as a sort of binding factor, because that also resonates now, today, among the populations in the Caribbean. So the connection with Haiti is not necessarily the fact that we have this longer migration history, but more that Haiti is a, a, a black country, Jamaica is a black country, we have these African roots, those are the things that bind us together. Jamaicans take great pride in saying that Bookman, who was one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution, was actually born in Jamaica, so they celebrate that. Um, but you don't really get the, 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 the sort of deeper understanding of all of these other elements. Matthew, thank you uh, for sort of portraying these underlying currents, both historical and contemporary, which uh, are difficult to measure and then difficult to weave together into a compelling story, which is what you've done. At lunch, we were talking about, uh, as you might imagine, uh, the state, or one should say the poor state of archives and records in the region and in Haiti in particular. And so uh, for someone to do the kind of detailed uh, lifetime work that Matthew has been doing to, to uncover these links and help us make sense of them uh, is to be commended. Uh, a related point, therefore, we sometimes ignore uh, at our peril the importance to a country of uh, maintaining and restoring its heritage. Uh, we tend to be driven by contemporary concerns, but we sometimes underestimate how important it is for nation building and democracy building to do something as simple, and I shouldn't say simple, but as direct as restoring records, perhaps putting them in electronic form, but in some ways preserving history, which is what makes us all what we are today. So thank you again, Matthew, for coming here. Thank you all for having joined us and for the discussion, and looking forward to seeing you all at another time.